Oh, there we go. Now it's recording. Okay. I didn't hit the pop-up. Um, starting a... There we go. Starting over, this is uh, NeuroUnity, a real synthesis of neurodiversity and the established clinical model of autism spectrum disorder. My name is Jonathan Dorfman, and I'm going to be telling you a bit about NeuroUnity. So... Uh, everybody has their own conflicting opinions and experiences with the autism spectrum. Um, young autistic adults tend to distrust their clinical providers, such as doctors, therapists, educators, caregivers. Oftentimes, they like to diagnose themselves rather than get a clinical diagnosis, which, if for those who are unaware, if you think there's an inaccessibility of resources as an adult on the spectrum... With a diagnosis, good luck trying to get that without a diagnosis on the record. Um, and clinical providers themselves feel that they lack the time in, in funding to give proper attention to overwhelming caseloads, and that tends to lead to excluding young autistic adults from decisions about their support systems. So what we're left with is what I call, uh, personally call, the great schism of autism, where everybody's us versus them, nobody's really agreeing on simple things like, is it a disability, is it a pathology, how do we go about moving forward? Um, so the purpose of this study is to attempt a, what's called a realist synthesis to examine the relationship between young autistic adults and their clinical providers, and to understand what conditions contribute to trusting and inclusive relationships between those two parties, and how more trusting and inclusive relationships can be maintained. And uh, to do that, I'm developing, or trying to develop through this research, a new conceptual framework to address what's believed to be conflicting ideologies between the neurodiversity movement and uh, the established clinical model, and I call that framework NeuroUnity. So what we're looking at is what are the characteristics and perspectives relevant to the relationship between young autistic adults and their clinical providers? Uh, what are the characteristics and perspectives that make some relationships between young autistic adults and their providers more trusting and inclusive than others? And how, building off that, how can trusting and inclusive relationships uh, be facilitated, formed, and maintained between young autistic adults and their clinical providers? Uh, going into my literature review, um, just the general timeline where we're at, um, I call the first generation since the, the discovery generation, because that's when autism spectrum disorders were starting to be identified. This is also uh, the era of Hans Asperger's famous research in the 40s, or infamous, depending on how you look at it. And um, autism was believed to be caused by, quote, refrigerator mothers. Um, about... 1962, we go into the second generation, autistic rights. This is when parents start and caregivers start speaking up to advocate for their children that, hey, we, we shouldn't be institutionalizing them just because they have this disability. We need to provide more uh, resources to, to bring them up to speed socially and everything. And um, by 1993, we have the self-advocacy era generation. Uh, that is uh, the, about the time frame that Jim Sinclair came out with Don't Mourn For Us, his famous essay um, that kind of kicks off this movement that Judy Singer later called neurodiversity in her thesis in 98. So if you'll notice, uh, each generation lasts typically about 30 or so years which means we're due to start thinking about where we're going in the future. And that's what I'm hoping to discuss today. Um, so uh, getting on to some of the research, um, this image uh, kind of looks like a bunch of interconnected dot points on a dot graph, you know, uh, that's kind of symbolic of the relationships across the autism spectrum. 
um, young adults have often felt social isolation and bullying and difficulties forging friendships uh, due to their disability. However, increasing opportunities for socialization has been shown to improve outcomes. Uh, autistic students want more specialized services from their uh, education support plans. However, they want the more discreet attention from educators because if you're pointing out the differences publicly, the bullying is going to get worse more publicly. Um, uh, there are language and cultural barriers making things more difficult. Uh, family relationships are strained. It's especially hard on siblings who have to be the constant guardian and protector. Uh, leads to burnout and a mixture of love and resentment. And oftentimes the siblings' uh, needs tend to be overlooked. Uh, there is, a, as mentioned before, a distrust of clinical providers. Sometimes parents feel dismissed when seeking a diagnosis for their child, uh, child and um, they receive conflicting opinions, second opinions, opinions from friends and family. Uh, there tends to sometimes be an overemphasis on negatives and an underemphasis on the positives of having a diagnosis. Um, some clinical providers even report that they have to emotionally distance themselves from their um, patients because they're just too afraid to get too close because of the limited resources and time. Um, and then there's just the feeling from those going through the diagnostic process that their lived experience is not as valued as clinical experience and social discourse. Um, and then we have this theme of validation and acceptance um, parents often model emotions for our children. This includes the negative emotions uh, that can sometimes come with the diagnostic process, uh, and which can delay really crucial early intervention services because there is a ticking clock to get started. Uh, diff uh, there's difficulty regulating emotions um, and... Uh, Autistic uh, individuals often rely on others to initiate emotional regulation to help them get started and sometimes even to identify their emotions. And diagnosed individuals are acutely aware of their differences, but what they really want is acceptance and socialization um, to improve their coping skills and mainstream attempts at inclusivity uh, oftentimes emphasize their differences, which, again, you have the stigma attached to it, now it's public, now the stigma finds a target. So, um, just some definitions here. Autism spectrum disorder, it's neurodeve uh, neurodevelopmental, it's characterized by impaired social communication and social interaction, oftentimes uh, involves restricted repetitive behaviors, uh, patterns of behavior from early childhood, which cannot be attributed to intellectual disability. This comes to us from the DSM-5, which is often used to diagnose in the U.S. Um, we're using identity-first language because many autistic individuals prefer identity-first prefer language. Um, this means you saying things like autistic person other than person with autism. Because the theory, uh, the thought on behind this is that you cannot separate the person from aspects of their being central to their identity. Um, uh, neurodiversity, it's grounded in the social model of disability and adopted by neurodivergent individuals seeking recognition, civil rights, and disability services appropriate to their level of functioning. Uh, it's informed by the biopsychosocial mo model of psychiatry developed from the anti-psychiatric movement of the 60s and 70s. Some prominent voices include John Elder Robeson, Temple Grandin, Jim Sinclair, and the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Uh, an advocate is any group or individual who represent the interests of autistic individuals and their interests in public discourse, all working towards, together towards the common goal of representing the interests of an autistic individual. This can include the autistic individual themselves advocating 
for their own interests, um, members of their family, like parents or siblings, their friends, a legal representative hired to support an autistic individual's interests is definitely an advocate. Um, moving on, the established clinical model is adopted by neurotypicals, professionals, and caregivers seeking normalization, reduction, and elimination of symptomatic behaviors of autism spectrum disorder, uh, which impair functioning and major life activities. The largest and most influential voice for this model is Autism Speaks. And it should be noted that a change in leadership in 2016 resulted in a cure no longer explicitly being mentioned as a priority, although they have a lot of history to try to overcome if they want to buddy up to more self-advocates. <laughs> Right, so, uh, what is a clinical provider? A clinical provider is any group or individual providing services or support to an autistic individual. We have some examples here, including doctors, therapists, educators, DSPs, employers, family, community support servicers, and caregivers. Um, now, uh, NeuroUnity, which we're all here for, is the proposed synthesis of neurodiversity in the established clinical model with the goal of increasing trust in the uh, clinical model to make it more inclusive of neurodivergent individuals. Oh, came the wrong button. Um, so what is a realist synthesis? To begin with, uh, a realist synthesis is an emergent methodological approach to combining, aggregating, and integrating primary research findings to create a new conceptual framework. It focuses on how the complex mechanisms of what, by which outcomes are produced uh, and how outcomes are affected across different contexts. So for this type of uh, methodology, uh, we're talking about um, ontology is uh, what we believe are, how, how we form our beliefs on reality Epistemology is how we uh, form knowledge and obtain knowledge. And methodology is uh, determined by our ontology and epistemology. So for a realist synthesis, we believe that mechanism A causes outcome B within context C. And uh, these, context, these outcomes may uh, vary depending on the context. We believe that knowledge is obtained gradually, it is incomplete, and it depends on con the conditions that produce it. Um, and the way we go about uh, testing these theories is that realist theory is used to analyze and make sense of data. Uh, I use the Ramsey's One Project Protocol that stands for Realist and Meta Narrative Evidence Synthesis Evolving Standards One. It's a mouthful. Um, so one would use a meta narrative uh, for quantitative research studies. Uh, real synthesis is looking specifically for qualitative research. Uh, it involves in, uh, a systematic review of existing literature. So um, the review steps for this type of methodology is to first identify the research questions search for primary research studies to include, assess them for quality, extract data from the good ones, uh, or helpful ones, I should say. Um, you synthesize the research, and what we're doing here today is disseminating the findings. So the criteria I used for the study is that they had included studies had to be published in English and utilize a qualitative research design uh, published between 1980 and 2022, 1980 being the year autism was first included in the DSM-3, and 2022 being when I was conducting this research. Uh, studies examining the opinions or attitudes of young adults on the spectrum aged between 18 and 30 years uh, toward their clinical providers uh, were included. And these studies had to have been published within the United States and the United Kingdom. I should, and or the United Kingdom, I should say. So if they were not in English, utilized a quantit quantitative or mixed methods research design, was published prior to 1980 or after 2022, um, they were not included. 
uh, if they did not examine the opinions or attitudes of young uh, adults on the spectrum, age 13, 18 to 30, uh, they were excluded. And any uh, study that was published outside the United States or the United Kingdom were also excluded. This is an. Just yeah. clarify, I didn't go back. Yep. Um, so this was, I, I'm sure you fixed it in the revised version. Yeah. Something that I flagged up, I was a little bit unclear, so I just want to ask the question. Yeah. So um, so in this last one, it seems like you're making a justification for excluding studies from the UK, but you included studies from the US and the UK. Is that right? Uh, studies from the US and UK are included across the board okay yeah and then also you said published in the u.s and the uk so you could do a study in singapore or china yeah if, if it was published in english in the u.s or uk i included it even if it was study of a different group right or group or nation yes okay so it's got to be published in the in a in, in a paper that published first came out in the u.s or the uk okay and so then how about sorry i'm just trying to understand it's mm -hmm. not that important but i am just trying to understand so mm -hmm. there are journals i guess that you know like you, i assume you didn't look up where the journal was based like there some of them i did okay when it so wasn't it, that it, obvious that they have to be published from the uk or usa so, yes but that's the main criteria and yes so, and published in english within the time frame um etc okay so i mean one question i have mm -hmm. about that is just I mean, maybe this is for later, um, mm -hmm. and it's not a huge problem, but like, if the idea is to limit to those in order to limit the impacts of other healthcare systems, but then you right. include people who could have been from other healthcare systems. That is an odd side effect of the research. Okay. And that's, yeah, you have to make those decisions. So we can talk more about that later. Right. I'm not overly concerned about it. I just really want to understand it at this point. Yeah. So this is a diagram of my search and review flow. It begins with identifying the records. There were about 270 of them. 262 were articles, eight were books. Um, after duplicates were removed, there were 246 records to sort through. I screened through uh, and excluded 202 of them. Um, based on their um, abstracts and their methodology and things like that. Um, I assessed 44 full text records for eligibility using a rubric. Um, nine were also disqualified for uh, further investigation, uh, revealing that they were kind of see through the cracks of the screening process and shouldn't have been eligible uh, to begin with. So they, on the programs of methodology, nation of origin, focus of research, and inaccessible research, there was one that no matter what I did, I could not get the full text um, of the research. So um, that left me with 38 articles and six books. However, after the eligibility process, uh, 21 were excluded, two for transferability, eight for reflexivity, two for relevance. And the final number included was 23 of those 19 being articles and four being books. Uh, this is a chart of how we get to the outputs of this research uh, being the outputs being guidelines and best practices for improving trust and inclusion within the broader autism spectrum community and a new conceptual framework that I'm calling NeuroUnity designed to facilitate applications of the first output. Um, this is a sample from my da data extraction evidence tables um, relating to the first research question um, the characteristics and perspectives relevant to the relationship between young autistic adults and their clinical providers. As you, uh, the, as you can see, uh, the first couple didn't really answer this particular question. Uh, the first one by John Elder Robeson was um, written with the neurodiversity movement in mind. 
the second one by Alec Frazier could easily apply to both the clinical model or neurodiversity. And so that was extracted uh, from these uh, evidence tables. I derived chains of inference. For example, uh, for the first research question, uh, I, diver I derived themes of disagreements over defining disability, young adult dependence on clinical providers, self-advocacy for young adults, exclusion of their voices from decisions about support, education about ASD, and the lack of support uh, for young adults. For the second research question involving inclusive and trusting relationships and what they look like, uh, themes derived from these, uh, this evidence table were uh, treating young adults with empathy, respect, and dignity, accommodations and expectations, and coordinating across young adult support systems. The third one, uh, ways to, to maintain, facilitate, form, and uh, trusting and inclusive relationships. You, uh, these themes included treating young adults with empathy, respect, and dignity, the expectations clinical providers have of them, uh, inclusion of young adult voices and decisions about support, clinical provider coordinating between young adult support systems, and young adult personal strengths and infant interests were leveraged by the clinical providers. Uh, from there, I was able to generate three hypotheses, the first one being relationships between clinical providers and young adults become more trusting and inclusive when clinical providers pr uh, treat young adults with empathy, respect, and dignity. Support systems for young adults are made available and coordinated between clinical providers and their interests and voices are incorporated into their support systems across settings, clinical settings. Um, clinical providers can educate themselves on how best to support young adult needs and provide these support systems. And finally, that young autistic adults can use input from clinical providers to better understand themselves, who they are, and how their minds function. So at the theory level, uh, the nature of the relationship between clinical providers and young autistic adults depends on the characteristics of the relationship, whether there is some integration of the support systems and the inclusion of young adult voices. At the sub-theory level, this looks like empathy, respect, and dignity, integrated support systems, inclusion of young autistic adult voices, and education about autism spectrum disorders. So, Boshoff tells us that the first impressions of first-line professionals uh, very much affected the diagnosis process and laid the foundation for all future experiences with other clinical providers. Um, when these support systems are coordinated and integrated with each other, the experience becomes more positive, sets the tone for other interactions in the future. Barrage and Hutchinson uh, tell us that clinical providers feel the need for emotional distance from their clients to prevent emotional overload from becoming too emotionally attached. To Pape and Lindsay tell us that this is occurring at a time when more empathy with caregivers is crucially needed. To follow up on this, Boshoff again, uh, the following year says that being treated with empathy, respect, and dignity would have made a tremendous difference in their in. Uh, caregiver perceptions of future clinical providers, many caregivers reported feeling that they were not being acknowledged by their clinical providers. So that's a problem. Coughlin et al. found that many clinical providers had no experience or knowledge of autism spectrum disorders prior to making the diagnosis, and Barrage and Hutchinson expanded on this lack of knowledge that even clinical providers felt they required more resources for training in subjects related to ASD. Uh, following that, DePape and Lindsay found that many of the self-advocates they interviewed felt their personal experiences were largely ignored in their interactions with their providers. In Granville and Santamaro et al. found that autistic individuals struggled to properly identify and label their emotions, a look toward their clinical providers for assistance in regulating them, 
Again, this can include family, friends, caregivers, their support professionals. Uh, so what is the NeuroUnity framework? What does it stand for? Uh, it unifies proponents of neurodiversity and proponents of the established clinical model. Um, uh, for empathy, respect, and dignity. Oh, that should have been another bullet point. Oh, it unifies these proponents, um, these two ideologies, empathy, respect, and dignity, complement integrated support systems. Uh, both are necessary in tandem um, for the NeuroUnity framework to fulfill its purpose as intended. And education on the part of both frameworks drives the NeuroUnity framework and faci facilitates more trusting and inclusive relationships. So to give a visual, imagine this as a spinning wheel. Education is turning the wheel. Uh, the wheel is made up of empathy, respect, and dignity, working in tandem with the integrated support systems. Without either one, it doesn't turn. Um, NeuroUnity is acting as a bridge of inclusion between proponents of the established clinical model and the proponents of neurodiversity. So if you think of that as a spinning wheel, we want that wheel to keep spinning forward. So the implications for self-advocates in practice, Chambers et al. says uh, we need to work with our clinical providers to help them develop their sense of identity and better understand who we are as autistic individuals and why we feel we are so noticeably different from our neurotypical peers. Frazier says that peaceful advocacy can help reduce stigma attached to an autistic diagnosis, foster more trusting and inclusive relationships. So for example, an autistic student can talk to their career counselor or job coach about their goals and ambitions, and work with them to determine what kind of education and training would be necessary to meet these goals, and then together determine what life skills are necessary to work on in order to meet career aspirations. That's one example. For clinical providers, uh, open-mindedness to the idea of additional training and education, if it means being able to su better support an autistic individual, uh, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and Singer, uh, say that we must all agree on uh, with each other on whether autism spectrum disorders are disabilities or pathologies. Just to be clear, Singer and Frazier would argue that autism spectrum disorders are disabilities, not pathologies. So, for example, a clinical provider can help guide the public conversation about autism spectrum uh, disorders with other clinical providers, with society in large, to help reduce the stigma that ends up being attached to disability. Uh, for theory, this means that both neurodiversity and the established clinical model have strengths to offer each other and therefore must strive to include each other. Self-advocates must respect the expertise of their clinical providers, and in turn, clinical supports must genuinely listen to and incorporate feedback from autistic self-advocates in the support systems they provide. Uh, the sub-theoretical chains of inference, that is emo empathy, respect, and dignity, and the integrated support systems must complement each other in tandem for your unity to work. Support systems must be made available and integrated across all clinical settings and be provided with empathy, respect, and dignity. Self-advocates must be willing to educate their clinical providers on their specific needs now best they could be supported. Clinical providers must be willing to educate autistic individuals on how their support systems can be used to help them better understand who they are and articulate why they feel so different. Um, as with any research, there were some limitations. This was only the first stage of theory development. It is ready for the second stage, which is to be fully tested and explored before being put into widespread practice. Uh, it is limited by the inclusion criteria, that is, um, studies only published in the US and the UK um, between 1980 and 2022, utilizing only qualitative methodologies and only published in English. Uh, there is, for future research, there is uh, a process called a Delphi panel, 
uh, which is a panel of external readers who uh, review, rate, and provide uh, critical feedback. Um, that, unfortunately, it was originally planned for this research, but it exceeded the scope of uh, the stage of theory development. So um, that is one recommendation for future research. Um, again, this could have looked like two rounds of uh, a Likert scale to, uh, where you one uh, set of statements you either strongly disagree is a one to five is strongly agree uh, and you would rank these numerical um, rankings um, statements uh, once for relevance like do you uh, is it relevant to what it is it's trying to move forward and once for validity which is do you agree with the statements as they are worded um numerical results of the second round ranking would be averaged and feedback would be incorporated into a more final version of the results of the realist synthesis any remaining dissent would among panel members would be reported alongside the nature of such dissent as limitations of the realist synthesis to be explored with yet still more future research in the interest of full honesty and transparency. I must, uh, I, I cannot exaggerate this enough. Careful consideration should be taken in selecting members of the modified Delphi panel. Hopefully you guys have a, um, a better understanding of my research today and what NeuroUnity is and what it's trying to accomplish. I just want to thank you all for attending this dissertation defense, and I'm opening the floor to comments and questions. First question, when do I get a water bottle? <laughs> that was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, uh, John, for that question. Mm -hmm. wonderful presentation. So, uh, serving as the chair of John's dissertation, we've been working very closely in the past year. We're we'll be meeting once a week, in addition to having uh, monthly voting retreats as well. So, John has always uh, risen up to the challenge. That was it. Can you do this? <laughs> it's done to the next time. And then he would share, you know, um, he runs into issues he will share with you. So, I just want to commend you on the drive and the persistence and just the um yeah just just the way you, you really brought all of them into this project even while you managed having a full-time job mm -hmm. in that transition so i just i'm just so pleased that we are here today when we're here in this project mm -hmm. in the way that I'm thank you i don't know if you all have some comments along those lines yeah, I mean, I, you know, John, you know, we met uh, a couple of years ago, a few years mm -hmm. ago, and we had a, a project there that you did a rotation with me, and I was just super impressed by the way you're able to wrap your head around things and kind of make them happen. It was it fits, um, and you know, this is a high level thing that you've done here. It's very impressive the work that you've done here. It's very clear that you were meticulous about it, and that you know you capitalized on all of your strengths of being able to focus but also to analyze and evaluate things at a very high level so i you know i'm very impressed by this um so i just you know, reiterate that and it's clear from the writing that you went through that process and so I, it's interesting to hear what actually happened because i don't know i just read the paper but it's very clear that this was a very you know um systematic way that you thought about this and gone through all this I just want to second the applause. I think that your um, articulation of the research questions, your research process, and the way that you have revealed these ideas mm -hmm. with evidence underneath it is so impressive. I really applaud you for that. Thank you. It's a challenge to do this while working, indeed. So you should really be taking extra time to celebrate that mm -hmm. for yourself and about yourself. All right. Thank you. So that's the nice part. <laughs> oh, here we go. What? Do, how do we really feel? 
I think I'll just look <laughs> up <laughs> the two experts here on this topic first. What would you like to, what are some of the main uh, thoughts you want to have? Well, the notebooks are coming out. The pages are flying. <laughs> I mean, positive comments. There. I mean, I, I really um, felt like there were so many strengths in what you presented today, including that um, your several elements of your selection process were well justified. You talked about anchoring the years of selection of the mm -hmm. articles with a rationale based on how the emergence of our understanding of autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorder has evolved. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that gives you incredible strength for how you can justify how you're interpreting mm -hmm. what you put together. So I, I wanted to make sure to um, note that. I think mm -hmm. there are a couple of, and I'll just go a little bit and then we can yeah, yeah. um, There are a couple of ways that, and I think I flagged this in the writing and the presentation mm -hmm. too, I think you want to continue to be a little bit cautious in how you put forward your, um, and I, I think we'll talk more about this, but mm -hmm. your absorption of the research that you're reading. Mm -hmm. So for example, there were a couple of places where you said like sort of they want or everybody wants, or like, this is, oh, right. I think you want to be, you know, right. when we have studies and say 99.9%. Yeah. But, it's know, still not everybody. Say, it's still not yeah. everyone. And yeah. I think you want to, um, it's still okay to say research suggests or mm -hmm. research has demonstrated that mm -hmm. the vast majority. I think you can put it forward with emphasis okay. without it being issued as a blanket statement. Right. That's that's important for for how you mm -hmm. think about your interpretation and use of the research base mm -hmm. that you're leveraging for your process mm -hmm. here. Um, <clears throat> I have a few broad sort of questions. I, mm -hmm. I'll start with two more specific questions. Can you tell me a little bit about your justification for quantitative studies to not be included in your process? Oh, um, I feel like numbers can oftentimes be misused or manipulated. And I really wanted to get to the core of what are the actual experiences of these people and these being represented by these studies? Because this is about the relationships between these people and how it affects the support systems they get. And I thought that was better represented by qualitative research. Yeah, can I just follow up with that? So I, I, I think that's legitimate. Um, I do wonder if that, because of your focus on that, um, I don't recall if there was any discussion of quality of life in people with autism, which is definitely relevant, which tends to be more sort of quantitative, but it's also qualitative. So I agree 100% that it doesn't, mm -hmm directly address the question that you're asking, mm -hmm. but I wonder if that focus on qualitative made you skip out on some of the background on quality of life, or is there any research on quality of life that's quantitative that's relevant to medicine use or Again, medicine experience? That, that is a limitation of the study is that it looked only at the qualitative research. Any number of future studies can certainly try to bring in the quantitative and the mixed methods research. Uh, and that could only serve to strengthen it, in my opinion. So. Articulated response. It's okay to start a research piece somewhere, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have right. to include everything. It's okay right. to set confines as long as you can mm -hmm. have that justification. Um, in a similar line, you excluded transition age, ages 14 to 18, and you know the life course framework would put forward that that's a formative stage at which individuals are right. identifying what their relationships with their clinical providers might look like and preparing for the transition from pediatric to adult care. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about starting at 18? Uh, I started at 18 because um, originally I was looking at 21 to 26, 21 being when um a lot of the pediatric resources are mandated to end and then it's almost like falling off the metaphorical cliff uh and then 26 was the age where um the united states and medical system insurances kick you off your parents plan um which further limits what resources you can pay for uh, but that didn't yield too, many, too much research to examine. So I decided 
We'll start at 18, the age of majority in many countries, including the U.S., and go through the next decade of, of life um, to age 30 to give that full next decade. Mm -hmm. And that opened up so much more research <laughs> to look through. Sure. Thank Ad you. nauseum. <laughs> That's very helpful. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, I'd also like to ask some specific questions before mm -hmm. we get to the bigger picture questions. Um, in the early di in the diagnosis section, the history of diagnosis, I've heard you right. mention Asperger's. Uh, you may or may not be aware that there's a controversy about some there is. Eastern Europe. Did you cite any of their work? Um, um, there were some articles that I came across, like news articles about Hans Asperger's uh, infamous um, rela relationship with the Nazi party. He wasn't himself a Nazi, but he was very funny. sympathetic. Did you um, about? So oh. there was an Eastern European woman who I think was Jewish. Oh. And therefore, right. was a part of mainstream Western European right. who had actually identified autism around the same time, if not before. Asper. Right. Um, so there's a couple of things I can point you to some sources, but mm. just you know, that can be explored with future research as well. Might be something to add. Just update that. So right. current because current mm -hmm. thoughts are that that as that, that Hans Asperger and Chandler are not the only people or even the first right. who identified autism. So if you cite them, maybe you should cite these people too. Well, I was mainly mentioning that this was what was prominent at the time. This mm -hmm. is the era when they were doing their research, right, so what I was saying. Relevant, but it's worth it. okay. yeah. mm -hmm. I can certainly add that in. Yeah. If, it, if it's relevant. If it true. makes sense. Um, yeah. I also wanted to ask, um, so what do you think about the... So when you do these qualitative, so when you look at qualitative studies mm -hmm. of young adults, you're looking at people who are speaking on their own behalf. And there's this huge issue right now, which mm -hmm. is that most of the, like there was a paper published recently in Autism Research Journal by a parent, a set of parent self-advocates. Mm -hmm. And they mostly talked about people with co-occurring disability, intellectual mm -hmm. disability. And so I don't think that this is necessarily a huge problem for your paper, but can you talk a little bit about the role, like the role of, co-occurring intellectual disability in self-advocacy, in perceptions of autism, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Like, so just big picture background, like mm -hmm. we have known the causes of Down syndrome for 40 something years, yeah. and we have no way of improving their intellectual disability right now, right. other than they do slightly different teaching methods right. like them. And when you think about autism, and you think about people who are advocating for themselves, you know, sort of self-advocacy mm -hmm. advocates and talking about not being diagnosed, et cetera, right. They're, talk they're talking from their own perspective, mm -hmm. verbally fluid people, people who get doctorates, and, right. uh, and then you have the parents talking about, my kid didn't talk until he was six, and now he's 20-something, and he speaks in you know single words, right? Right. So, to me, co-occurring intellectual disability is the elephant in the room there, right? Right. But your study, because it only focuses on qual qualitative studies, um, doesn't actually address the perspective of right. people with intellectual disability that affects their speech and language. I guess that's a side effect um, of the methodology, but the goal, the end goal here is that we bring those parents together with the self-advocates and their clinical providers, and together we come to some understanding of, okay, here's what the needs are, here's where we want to go, what do we? What supports do we need in place to get from point A to point B, where we want to be, right? And um, regardless of whether there's an intellectual disability or where on the spectrum you are, because it, it's always going to be a fluctuation, right? Um, that somebody who, and a lot of people don't like this terminology, but there are a lot of high functioning air quotes uh high functioning uh self advocates who um don't need as much resources they just want to just zoom along do their thing and then there are a lot of um other autistic individuals who maybe might have an intellectual disability co-occurring or who just 
aren't as quote unquote high functioning um, as the other self advocates who may need a little extra help articulating uh, what their needs are and identifying what their needs are. And that's where we all need to come together and make sure that regardless of where you are on the autism spectrum, that your needs are being met in a way that is acceptable to the individual and the families and that the clinical providers that we're all agreeing on the same page and moving forward together to get you where we want to be. Yeah. Whatever your, their goals are. Yeah. And so that I think feeds into my next question, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you came up with a number of themes. So thanks for your response. Very mm -hmm. helpful. Um, but you came up with a number of themes, uh, and they're really good. Themes. And so, uh, you know, Sort of part of my question, without directly asking it, was: Do your ideas apply to people with co-occurring intellectual disabilities? Right, and and I'm not asking you to answer that question right now. I'm asking you to answer a different question, which mm -hmm. is: Are your ideas specific to autism, or are they general to anyone? Does anyone want empathy, right. respect? I would imagine, like I use autism as a starting point because I myself am autistic. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I wanted you need to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. When, uh, eventually, I would like to see this be applicable to um, OCD or ADD or dyslexia, no matter what your neurodivergence is or what your neurotype is, that this kind of principle could be either adapted or utilized in those settings as well. Yeah, and so, but do you think anyone's ever looked into that before? Like, do you, do you know, is there a literature on um, what patients want from their medical providers and service providers? I mean, it, it, usually that comes from like memoirs from like John Elder Robeson and Tumble Grandin talking about what their experiences were. Not so much in academ academic uh, articles that you would find in like The Lancet or. Uh, other academic journals. Uh, that was the only example I could think of in the moment. But um, um, I mean, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of literature, especially on social media right now. Uh, there's you could examine that and parse whatever you can out of that for where the current public opinion is. Um, it's not necessarily reflected in academic, um, scholarly articles, but, um, it, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> your, your answers I, are good. I'm just yeah. trying to think, I'm wondering, I honestly don't know the answer to this, but my guess is that in the field of medicine, like mm -hmm. you're treating cancer patients, right? if you ask a cancer patient what they want, I think what they say would be quite similar to what you're saying autistic people, right. right? And so, you know, there probably is some kind of medical literature that addresses this. And one of the questions would be, is there something unique to autism? Or it's just that we're not giving autistic people what they need, like everyone else needs. I think right? is... And so that's yeah. really my question at its heart, is, uh -huh. is it, are we just failing the autistic population by not giving them what everyone wants? And then we already know because we've asked cancer patients and right. people with I think that's part of it. You know, or, or is it that there's some, you know, maybe there's something unique about autism and what they need, or maybe there's it's not as unique and it's just this is a documentation of what we would expect. Uh, I think that's also a part of it. Part of it is, especially after the age of 21, you, you're still going to need re the support system there. But the number of the support systems that are operating for those that age group is largely diminished. For whatever reason, they just don't offer it to adults. And we need to start understanding that these are lifelong conditions that the level of support needs to be ongoing throughout the course of the individual's life. Um... So part of it is we're kind of failing the adult population with autism. Um, part of it is uh, documenting this is pretty, which should be obvious to anybody with the condition, you know, 
what we want, what they want, what everybody wants, you know, um, and this is kind of like a first step towards, okay, how do we fix this problem and fix the system so that as many people as possible um, are able to get what they need to meet their goals. There is such a concept as interdependency. and Everybody talks about independence, independence, independence. I want to be independent, you know. But part of that is knowing... When you don't have what you need, where do you go to get that? And that's the interdependent part. It's interdependence so that you can develop independence. And uh, that's another part of this puzzle that we're trying to put together, no pun intended. Um, so um, to answer your question, part of it is we're just not giving them what we need. Um Another part of it is the system set up that way. Another part of it is we're documenting this is what our needs are, this is what we want. And then the question now becomes how do we get there? <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think more is a little more specific, and, and that's around your range of timing. So mm -hmm. you're covering, uh, you know, 40 plus years span for right. the prevalence of autism. Like mm -hmm. 10,000 to, you know, as a one in 36. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I realized that your study was clearly defined as passing in. They went right. across those years, I'm wondering if there's a way that you can articulate or suggest ways that you might build upon the the period effects that were observed during that time oh, it would oh. be um the increase in prevalence but also the associated shared societal understanding right. of autism and increase in understanding among clinicians to some degree right um again like that's what the timeline portion of my literature review was attempting to kind of dig at was you know, when this was first discovered, nobody knew what to do with anybody except just put them in an institution. I'm like, oh, you didn't get enough love from your mother. It's mom's fault. You know, you you go into an institution for the rest of your life. That's where you stayed. Uh, about the 60s uh, is when people started saying, well, why can't they enjoy a, a, a more typical life? Just because they have a disability doesn't, like, somebody breaks their leg, you're going to institutionalize them, you know? Um, so that's when we started seeing all these specialized schools, all this anti-psychiatric movement, um, because in, in retaliating against, you know, just institutionalizing everybody, it's not the mother's fault. There were some bio, uh, biological, um, causes determined, not that we really understand which specific genes and which combinations cause it but that it's not just environmental it's not the parents necessarily the parents fault that they did anything wrong and then you punish the kid by institutionalizing them for their entire life and then somewhere around the early 90s um the individuals themselves started thinking like why can't we speak up for ourselves you know and there's been this progression towards um everybody getting on the same page and then i'm hoping with neurounity and the next generational uh paradigm shift that we can kind of speak to that and kind of figure out okay where are we going as a community here and then apply that to other neurodivergent neurotypes yeah, even the articles that you mm -hmm. emphasized in your presentation here mm -hmm. predominantly in the last five to seven years I mean, that's right. most of the research was done in that time. So I think for your, for the neuro mm -hmm. unity wheel to keep turning, mm -hmm. as you described mm -hmm. so eloquently, there has to be a way that you are thinking about the rapid uptick, the rapid changing understanding right. of individuals and the emerging evidence base. So I think mm -hmm. that could be an important way for you to think about and propose next steps. As some for uh, future research. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Oh boy, the smile. <laughs> I'm gonna ask a light question mm -hmm. first. Uh, so, what are um, what are you most proud of out of this whole journey? What am I most proud of? Yeah. Well, um, I don't mean to make light of this, but if it sounds that way, I apologize. Just for the sheer fact that I haven't collapsed here with anxiety today. <laughs> Getting closer, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You gave a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Which actually really did tie, I think, in a very concrete and clear way for the audience that do a significant job. And I think what I'm hearing is that the questions are... Uh, they push you because I think you're kind of helping me to figure out mm -hmm. that if you do take this you know, health side mm -hmm. of this institution, would that be of interest to you? Because if you're going to present this work outside, right. like, then these are some of the things I need to think about. Yeah, that people mm -hmm. probably will ask you. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to defend, you need to mm -hmm. be able to think about it. You need to be mm -hmm. able to it. So I think it's where really, those questions are really coming right. from. So it is a question actually from us. What are your thoughts about the next steps in terms of this work? Would you, what are some of the ways, like, I don't know, I know you're busy with work and et cetera. I know. And I don't know how, maybe how much time you want to spend thinking even more <laughs> about this project. But are you, what are your thoughts about taking this work outside of here? Are you, what are your thoughts about having energy to, do more than say with a down front panel or to say you go through public. I would say I need a little bit of a mental break before I can start. <laughs> Give me a little bit to be able to build that energy back up. Because this is something technically about two years coming. Yeah. So, um, need a little bit of a mental break and then I can start thinking about the next steps. Um, yeah, because I think uh, just among this committee, I think there's, you know, definitely some willingness to kind of share some additional ideas mm -hmm. with you. When sure. Okay. To kind of take and just give me a few months to yeah. recharge. Yeah. <laughs> and I it, think... It, it's really important work. I mean, I think what yeah. you've done here is really important. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the process is important, too, because, you know, to get a doctorate, you have to learn research and you have to learn something. Um, I do have one more question mm -hmm. um, that I want to ask, and, and the whole committee is kind of interested in this. Um, but you know, I think that you've gone, you've done due diligence, you've gone through this process of the research, learning how to do a proper research study, and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, one question I have that's that's going to come up externally, but also internally here now is. What did you learn from this? So when you went into this, you were a stakeholder. You'd already right. read a lot of blogs, mm -hmm. you'd already read articles, right. books, you you know, you have a bias at some level. Right. And that's what the Delphi panels are for, but I think the Delphi panel is a helpful thing. Right. I actually think you it's possible for someone to do it on their mm -hmm. own. Um and so I wanna ask you what were your preconceived ideas when you went into this project and which of those got changed by the time you were done with the process? Um, well, before I went into this process, I wasn't aware of some of the things on the clinical model and like that even they feel like they need more time and training and resources and um, they're just not getting it on their end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not something that from the patient end you really see too much of. So um, that kind of opened my eyes to like, okay, they are kind of trying as best they can, even if they never encountered it before, have no formal training in it before, that there is a desire on the clinical providers in to do better than they've been trained to do. Um, so, you know, when you're looking on social media, you're reading all the books, you know, Jim Sinclair, John Robeson, uh, Temple Grandin and such. And you're looking at all the arguments from the parents saying, that's not real autism, this is real autism. And then you got the advocates saying, don't light it up blue, red, red instead. And it just kind of seems a little bit like we're spinning our wheels on minutia, right? 
and nothing of importance is getting decided on or resolved. And, um, and that's what started me thinking about this, um, that I wanted to try to bring people together so that as many people, as said before, as many people as possible can get what they need and reach their goals, um, whatever, however big or small their goals are, you know, not everybody's going to be uh, reaching for the stars of a doctorate. Sometimes that star is going to be, um, I remember to take a shower today, or I said, I love you to my parents. Um, you know, some stars are more simple than other stars. And um, other stars are more complex than more stars. And, um, really, um, uh, it's kind of eye opening to see where everybody's at on both sides, you know, because, uh, coming from the, we're on position, like, if you think about it as, like, a neuropolitical meter, right? You got red is, uh, or let's make it gold, right? Gold is uh, neurodiversity, um, and blue is autism speaks, you know? I'm kind of in the middle in that green area, you know? Uh, where it's like, okay, I can see how they could be frustrated over here in neurodiversity, but I also see that we're not gods. We're not perfect. We're not a master race, you know. We do need a little bit of help getting what we need and what we want out of life. So how do we bring that together? Yeah, you had a lot of you had several very insightful comments about that. You did include description of the efforts of the clinicians. Is there anything in the stakeholder stuff that when you were reading, you go, no. oh, I didn't predict that, or I didn't expect to see that in this paper. Like, I didn't know the stakeholders felt that. I don't personally feel right. that, or I didn't feel that until now. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything from reading the stakeholder descriptions? Um, when I went into this, I was kind of thinking like, okay, neurodiver just from social media alone, right? Uh, it looks like neurodiversity is trying to resent neurotypical society, and that's not really what it was meant to do, you know? So I kind of went in thinking, like, okay, how do I convince this group to play nice, you know, with the other group while I'm trying to get them to come to the table? And uh, there were uh, parts of it where some studies that suggested that, you know, as long as that they felt listened to as long as there was that empathy and dignity and uh, such in the the services that were being provided that there was no problem with with con talking it out with the clinical provider you know there are some people willing to come to the table other people are a little more militant about it than others but um there are people willing to come together and say, okay, I'll listen. You know, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I'll be civil about it. You know, and that kind of was a pleasant surprise to read that because uh, usually you just hear about, um, oh, I hate this about my provider. I hate that about my provider. They treat me like this, you know, and to read that, um, there are some instances where this is already in play. Uh, NeuroUnity is kind of built upon those ideals. Um, that was a pleasant surprise to know that, okay, there is somewhere to start building on this. Thank you. Right. Um, no, I have two last suggestions. I mean, I, I do think that as you look back at what you've done here and mm -hmm. to the for the finalization process, there there is some reflection here on like how is the system failure an ingredient by way of the lacking you talked about the service that you talked about lack of supports in the environment, both for clinicians and for individuals right. in the system. And I think mm -hmm. that's an important Overlay. Mm -hmm. Now the clinicians have a perfect set of resources to turn right. to. We really let that. It's down. finite. 
Yeah, exactly. And and how how might the incentivization for clinical providers be there? Right. One of the mm-hmm. Bo articles talked about uh, the need for being open to more right. supports. And so, how do you move from being open to it to really seeking it out when right. doing medical education might have a thirty minute slot for autism? Right. Um, primarily within the detection of intervention. So those are. It relates, they're not issues I need you to discuss, okay. today, but I think that they are mm-hmm. components that you should think about right. for the meaningful listening mm-hmm. impact of your work. And I really applaud you. you. This is this is a wonderful presentation that we're going to today. Thank you. That's great. Um, so I've been taking notes and you've been recording, so that's great, John. Um, yeah, so I feel like based on this discussion... I'm oh, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>